Today on CityCast DC, if you were in DC right before 4th of July, chances are you remember getting a pang of worry when the city sent out a water boil advisory. Luckily, it was over by the next morning. District-wide advisories like that one are rare now. The last one was back in 1996. But reporter Aman Azar from Inside Climate Now tells us they could become more common. He's here to explain what happened and what it means for water safety in D.C. going forward. Today's Thursday, August 8th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what D.C. is talking about. on, take me back to July 3rd. I'm sitting on my deck. I get that text alert that's like, boil advisory for all of D.C. What exactly happened and how did folks react when they got that notification? Yeah, so Bridget, uh, what happens is that just around 10, 10 10.30-ish, this boil advisory came through. It, It flashed on people's screen as well. And it said that, please, from this point on, boil your water for at least one minute. And it also alerted that if you kind of bought anything like an ice or ice cream or something like that, which was like made after 9 p.m. on that day, throw it away. So I didn't actually look at the water after the advisory. Had I like poured a, a glass of water from the tap, what would it have looked like? Just cloudy? Would it, would it have had like stuff floating in it? No, it doesn't usually have any kind of stuff floating in it. It's just more cloudy than it is supposed to be. So the water that we get is supposed to conform to the advisory or the guidelines which are being issued by you know, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, for that, for example. And all the water which is being supplied through D.C. water, which is a water utility here in D.C., it has to conform to those kinds of water guidelines. And when they felt at that time on the evening of July 3rd that water is not as clear as it is supposed to, that's where they decided to issue that boil water advisory. And it was it, it went in effect for, I guess, a, around 10 hours before it was lifted in the early hours of July 4th. So I've experienced boil advisories for like parts of DC. Northwest is often impacted, but I don't know that I've ever experienced like all of DC. How many people exactly were affected by this? I think a good measure of that is how many people are kind of served or serviced by D.C. water, and that's close to a million people. So this advisory went to the entire Washington, D.C. and parts of Northern Virginia, including uh, Arlington County. So that's a lot of people. So so that was the magnitude of this spoil advisory. And it has happened, I suppose, after two decades, a little over two decades. Okay, so what exactly do we know? You know, it's been a few weeks. What do we know about what caused this water boil advisory? So DC water gets everything, gets its water supplies through through the reservoirs, which are operated by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So they are basically dependent on that. And when I approached uh, Army Corps of Engineers, they explained that what happened. And according to them, there was like a, a floating algae mat, which means like a lot of algae bloom, green algae, which is like a floating green thingies on top of the water that you can often see probably sometimes. That kind of uh, invaded one of the uh, treatment plants, the filtration system, because that's where the whole water is treated before it is passed on. And that's when it clogged one of the filtration system of the Cardia water treatment plant and was so severe that the pressure dropped in water, which, which meant that there was a a lot reduced amount of water going from that treatment plant to Washington in terms of what it needed. So then they had to shift because of that while they clear out all the filtration with different chemical compounds and whatnot. They kind of shifted a lot of uh, their water treatment to Macmillan treatment plant in Northwest DC to kind of ensure that there's enough water supply to go to District of Columbia just to meet their requirements. So this is what happened on that day. So what causes algae blooms in the first place? Algae blooms are fed by nutrients. And one of the important nutrients for that is nitrogen. And that comes from a variety of sources like sewer outfalls, typically. It also comes from a lot of uh, stormwater runoff. That's anything, the baddest of pollutants and contaminants that you can think of on roads and highways and whatnot, 
when there is a lot of rain, everything washes and goes into rivers and tributaries because they, you know, they just pass through so much of a stormwater system. And somewhat sometimes because of uh, the climate change, we are getting a lot more rain and it's beyond the capacity of our typical stormwater system, which were built decades ago. So it kind of, a lot of it washes into directly into our uh, waterways and open water. So that's, with that goes the nitrogen and phosphorus, which uh, kind of contributes to this kind of uh, reaction. Uh, and, and then the sunlight comes in and it kind of uh, whips up this uh, algae, which is called, in this case, it was a green algae. And, and thankfully not a more toxic kind of algae, which is cyanobacteria. This might sound stupid. It sounds how it sounds. I've never really thought about the fact that when you walk around, all the different storm runoff and sewage and all that junk you see in the street, that's being like in our sewers, into our waterways. When you put it that way, I'm like, oh, that's not really that appealing to think about. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem which is, which is getting bigger because it's, it's like a dog poop, for example. I'm sorry to say that. But anything that you can possibly think of that is on the roads makes its way through our stormwater systems and go into open water. That's where it's supposed to be filtered and, you know, preserve a, a lot of bad things from going into our open waters. But it doesn't because that's the, one of the hardest things to control. So that's one. The other big uh, source of nitrogen and phosphorus getting into our open waters, and in this case, we're talking about Chesapeake watershed. And where this happened was particularly a part of Potomac River. It's also fed by a lot of agricultural runoff because we put a lot of uh, intensive fertilizers for our crop harvest and whatnot. And when rain happens, it leaches into water and also runs off from the fields and into open water. So we have two basic uh, ways of these nutrients getting into the water. And they're, they're, that's one of the biggest challenges also for a lot of public agencies to control. And that's agricultural runoff and stormwater runoff. And that's what feeds directly into this nutrient problem, which causes these kinds of algae. And it's becoming bigger because of the warmer temperatures, because it's conducive to, you know, to these bacteria to come alive and multiply and whatnot. And on top of it, a lot of rain, which is, again, getting a lot of these nutrients directly from our agricultural farmlands and from our uh, highways and whatnot into the open waters. And it was particularly severe this time around to the point that when I asked DC Water, how severe was it? They told me that some of the employees who have been working at uh, DC Water for the last 40 years think that this year it was the most severe that they had seen in their entire experience. So, so this is probably now the kind of brew which is uh, giving us this kind of a nightmare. Is it because it's been so hot lately? Like, and I wonder, does that mean that we can sort of expect this to be a problem that just intensifies as climate change worsens? Environmental Protection Agency, when I kind of contacted them, they told me that climate change will lead to higher air temperature with a corresponding effect on, you know, water temperatures. This is, this is how it happens. And then that kind of along with the runoff of nutrients, kind of results in conditions which are favorable for algae blooms. So basically, if you put all these together, it's with changing climate, the harmful algae blooms will occur more often in fresh and marine water bodies and will be more intense. So this is exactly the kind of a thing that we're seeing now. So, you know, you mentioned that this time around it was this green algae, which doesn't really pose a risk to people's health. But it sounds like you're saying that the next time this happens because of climate change, it might be a dangerous algae bloom or a kind of algae bloom that does actually potentially pose a risk to our health. Well, this has happened before, Bridget. In 2014, there was a case in Toledo, uh, Ohio, where there was a much nastier toxin related to algae blooms, which happened a lot more people and with a lot more intensity, and you cannot even issue a boil water advisor because that does not destroy that bacteria. So we have seen these kinds of bad, you know, episodes happening. And while I have no authority to say what's likely to happen next time around, what I can tell you is 
that in my uh, correspondence with the Centers for Disease Control Specialist uh, and with the EPA specialist, they have a common view that because of the new emerging climatic and environmental conditions, there it will likely have more effect. And, and unless we stop the nutrients from entering watersheds and open waters, this will be a persisting problem. And the one probably which we just saw is just like one ominous sign of potentially things to come. How rare are these algae blooms? Like, is it common enough where there is a system in place or a protocol in place and that what happened on July 3rd just happened to be a particularly huge one? Or how does it typically work? It's a good question. Uh, algae blooms happen quite frequently. In fact, in Potomac, what I was told by one of the specialists from uh, University of Maryland's uh, Center for Environmental Studies was that this is traditionally what happens uh, a lot in Potomac River. So it, there's nothing out of the ordinary for blue-green algae to exist in, in, in water bodies like Chesapeake uh, watershed. But the intensity and the severity is something which is more problematic. And for that to happen, you have to have certain kind of uh, environmental conditions, which are now becoming more prevalent. So a lot of public agencies like the Maryland Department of the Environment, for example, which has a mandate to control you know, or have measures in place which can reduce the the nutrients. And, and in this case, I'm talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments from entering into the bay waters, then they're finding it extremely hard to control it. And the, on the federal level, it, the responsibility goes to the Environmental Protection Agency. But in a, a few of my interviews, they were quite categorical that these are non-point sources, which means that you cannot control a lot of them. Uh, in their experience. And that's been a persisting problem for 40 years now. So that being said, there are different ways that different public agencies are monitoring the situation. Uh, There is a collaboration between the EPA and NASA and U.S. Geological Survey. uh, So they can have a near real-time monitoring of concentration of particularly cyanobacteria, which is a very toxic form of the algae blooms. And, and they have like cyanobacteria assessment network where you can actually monitor things and provide your input as well. But this interagency kind of uh, coordination is becoming increasingly important to kind of monitor and then come up with the right kind of strategies when the situation happens. There are a number of programs also run by the EPA, by the CDC and other agencies to have those kinds of checklists of what to do when this happens. The fact of the matter is that it did happen this time around to Washington, D.C., and that too on the eve of July 4th, when, you know, all the celebrations are about to kick in, where there's like particularly stressed time for, you know, activities related to fire suppression because of the National Mall and all the celebrations going on, people having a good time. So that's what makes it tricky and something to watch for in days ahead. Yeah, terrible, terrible timing. I read, I read in your article that particularly around the July 4th holiday, Historically, people are using more water because of fireworks and, you know, what you needs you might have for firefighting and things like that. So definitely terrible timing with all the visitors coming in to see things like could not have been worse. You know, you mentioned that the treatment plant got clogged because of the volumes of blooms this July. Are they coming up with any kind of potential solutions to specifically resolve that aspect of the problem? Like I said, they do have checklists and and different procedures uh, to kind of mitigate this kind of problem from actually taking place. They can move their in you know intake uh, from any place where they feel that there could be an intensive algae bloom outbreak for that matter. But again, despite that, it did happen, and it clogged the filtration point enough for them to actually have a drop in the pressure and reduced kind of a water you know, to provide to DC water at that time. And it seems as though there's a there's a real risk. And what about solutions for the root causes of these algae blooms, like particularly for the sewage pollution and all that dog poop that you were talking about in the water earlier? According to the Environmental Protection Agency, the first thing that you have to do is to reduce the organic materials from reaching rivers and lakes, which may aid in reducing the occurrence of such blooms. And what we've seen is that in the last 40 years, It's been challenging, so we're yet to see what happens next. Now, many public 
water system routinely do monitor their source water intake and, and kind of treat algae blooms near intakes, uh, you know, with a view to minimize impacts to their treatment plants and kind of to finish drinking water. So there are a number of strategies for public water system and states to kind of routinely use these notification systems, share information about blooms and, you know, other water quality events and have procedures in place to address it. I think the only other thing is when it happens, what happens then? And we saw that actually with all these procedures in place, sometimes these algae blooms are kind of still able to get into the treatment plants enough to kind of create this kind of a boil water advisory and, 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 and a wider public health prompt. I know that D.C. mostly relies on one main water source. Does, is this something that makes us in D.C. like uniquely vulnerable to this kind of problem? Like, is that normal for most cities? You're right. I mean, we're, we're provided uh, by Washington Aqueduct, and that is managed by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who also operate the two um, treatment facilities. And uh, from what I understand is that uh, D.C. water is probably the only uh, water utility, which entirely relies on on a secondary source to provide them with water, and they do, they did say that in view of this particular incident, they will be reviewing their own options and different procedures. So, what do you think DC residents should be keeping a lookout for when it comes to all this? I think one of the things was that when this happened, people kind of there was a brief run in on the supermarkets and local grocery stores because people wanted to just lay their hands on whatever drinking water they can. And they did. I mean, different uh, supermarkets and stores uh, were almost, you know, they, people went out and, and got what they could. So aisles were emptied out in some ways. The good thing is that it lasted briefly, but a more a longer event of this nature would probably prompt a more challenging situation. Yeah, that's that's a good thing to highlight. I remember when we got the advisory, I was trying to remember, like, well, when was the last time I filled this Brita? When was the last time I made this ice? Like, you really start thinking about, you know, and it, it just really prompt, like, I wasn't sure if anything in my kitchen or in my apartment was safe to drink, because who knows what time the last time you filled that Brita from your tap was, you know? Absolutely. And and I think uh, one of the things probably which uh, a lot of uh, public agencies uh, and, and public water systems will be watching is how the climate change or the warming temperatures are likely to impact this the situation of this sort and, and what could be the possible consequence, because that that's exactly where a lot of uh, future challenges would lie. Well, something to look forward to. Aman, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell your friend who was super freaked out about the water? You can rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then.